mouse click. Tab 579. Click. Mouse click. Backspace 10. Pine Point was the first place I ever went alone. I was nine, living in Yellowknife, and went there for a hockey tournament. I don't remember much. The 45 minute plane ride, those giant propellers, the rink's blue lobby, and that's about it. This isn't the plane. My team's not on it. But it is Pine Point, around the time I was there. My family left the North when I was 10. We moved to Regina, and I became that kid who got A's and F's. The guy who didn't look forward to the day things would change. My name is Mike Simons. One night last year, I went online to see what had become of Pine Point. Turns out, Pine Point isn't there anymore. Really? The website I found was called Pine Point Revisited. This is what it looks like. Plenty of images of people and enormous trucks, big holes in the ground. It was a mining town. This isn't Facebook. The photos have scratches, wrinkles, and dust. They reminded me of my own family album. My dad died in 1999. When I try to picture him, I don't see him. I see photos of him. Though I had only stayed a short while in the actual town of Pine Point, I spent hours going through its memorial. The site was the least disingenuous thing I had seen in a long time. Looking in, it's hard not to think that it was a great time to be alive and up north, in a time before seatbelts and sunscreen, when you could still pull block-long wheelies without fear of consequence. The pictures are impossibly friendly. Even the colors and textures seem unselfconscious. Wood paneling, perms, velour, deep shag. The mine closed in 1987. Most industry towns, after losing their purpose, attempt resurrections, or just slowly wither away. In Pine Point, they decided to erase the town from the face of the earth. By the following year, almost everything had been hauled away, buried, or burned. Even the arena where they held their winter carnivals, home to my last little flickering memory, gone as though it never was. That snare had a breaking strength of two tons. The dart was full of something called Telazol, brought to you by Pfizer. The same people who make Zoloft and Viagra. The next thing I know, I'm wearing a, a VHF collar and I have my own radio frequency. They also gave me a number. Bear 71. National Park in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. Bears and humans here live closer together than any other place on Earth. That explains the radio caller constantly beeping my location to some ranger playing God. There are 15 remote sensing cameras in my home range, plus infrared counters and barbed wire snags to collect my hair. I call it the grid. I live around a town called Canmore, in the Bow River Valley. Now Canmore has doubled in size over the past decade and it gets five million tourists a year. It's not like I can tiptoe around it at all. I need 500 square kilometers just to find enough food to raise my cups. P. 
people come to Banff to see what's been lost almost everywhere else. Everyone wants to see a grizzly bear, but of course, no one wants to be killed by one. There used to be this beautiful patch of bright red buffalo berries right in the campground by the firewood pile. Bear 66 and I used to sneak there. You know, when you're young and you push boundaries. The first six months after I got the radio caller, I was chased away by rangers 12 times. They call it aversive conditioning. I call it rubber bullets. Even at a distance of 100 feet, a rubber slug is still moving at 650 kilometers an hour. The rangers know where I am from the day I leave my den in the spring to the day I go back to sleep in the fall. I suppose it's like most of the surveillance that goes on today. It's partly there to protect you, and partly to protect everybody else from you. We're standing very close to the house here, and this, this ended up being uh, Vi's, chicken and steak. And uh, right next to it is the storehouse um, and storeroom for the restaurant. And that's that little red building right oh, there. Oh, so it's still here. Yep. And that's one of the only buildings left standing at Union near Maine, near what used to be Vancouver's most vibrant neighborhood, Hogan's Alley. It's the idea behind a brand new app circa 1948 being showcased this week at New York's Tribeca Film Festival by Vancouver artist Stan Douglas and the National Film Board of Canada. It's taken five years to create the, this digital recreation of Hogan's Alley. It's um, a project about two places that no longer exist in Vancouver uh, from 1948 post-World War II. But at a larger meta level, it's, it's about how history repeats itself. What brings you to the hotel? I've been told there's a reprobate bookkeeper here. Oh, I don't know about that. You don't know Percy Wallace? The free interactive app also reveals the inside of the second Hotel Vancouver in 1948. You can hear conversations between bad cops and waitresses, old radio shows, even returning soldiers and their families living in the hotel. It was torn down by the Eaton family a year later. Now it's the site of the new Nordstrom's. So you're right on that cusp of massive change. And floating in the background is the first ideas of the expressways, the highways and the freeways. So I think it's a perfect time to capture an element of the city that we forget about. Hogan's Alley was ultimately bulldozed to make way for the Georgia and Dunsmuir viaducts. And now those viaducts are likely coming down and a new community will eventually pop up here, possibly similar to one circa 1948. Randy Neal, Global News. Well, take a step back there, Perkins. Go uh, oh, there, easy. Just take another step back. Get out that rabies or something. I guess he doesn't like you much. I can't say I care too much for him. Yeah, he doesn't like you. He doesn't like some people. Oh, now you're insulting. I'll kick him in the teeth if it comes near me. He's... If I close my eyes, I can picture the house I grew up in. I walk up to the front door, grab the doorknob, turn it, and walk in. Wow. 
and everything is just as it was in 1993, when I was five years old. You were already at the front door when I arrived, telling me about your day. Hey. <laughs> Come here, little man. Draw whatever's in your heart, I tell you. I scrub like a mad woman. You can see that I'm scared. You didn't realize I could get so scared, and, and I can see you're scared too. And as you lay there, listening, you thought to yourself, one day I'm going to take away all your pain. One day. It felt so real, like I was actually a part of it. Part of what's been fun about collaborating on The Mandalorian with Lucasfilm and Disney is that we have been able to see through a few technical innovations and a few firsts that I think are going to have a lot of impact on the way uh, television and movies are made moving forward. In partnership with ILM and Epic, we have put together a system whereby which we can have game engine, real-time render, and video wall technology coming together to create a backdrop for the big, beautiful world of Star Wars. The volume is 21 feet tall. It's 75 feet in diameter, run by seven machines. 
pumping the visuals onto the screen that's, that's been created in pre-production and can be on the screen within 24 hours of, of being finaled. It's incredibly impressive when you first walk out there because it completely surrounds your peripheral vision. And you really quickly forget that you're indoors and you're not out on some planet's surface. It feels like a real three-dimensional environment surrounding you because it is a three-dimensional environment. You can allow your key creatives to all make decisions together so that the shots are captured entirely in camera, which allows for a better performance. And what was so exciting about this is by bringing those people together, things started to click and we started to realize, well, let's not just do green screen and interactive light. If we're gonna design the whole set and game engine ahead of time, maybe we could have some in-camera effects. Everything in the volume is designed to both light the actors and to be a background that we can directly photograph. So you end up with real-time final pixels in camera. If you look at visual effects, heavy films, you've got a, a film set and then it's gonna to go to post and it's gonna get the world put in. Here we're considering all of that at the same time and how do we create a background and foreground that live together on the volume harmoniously. When we started to play with the idea of using Unreal Engine for virtual production, that's one of the things that uh, Richard and John started to embrace is that you've got this very dynamic world where you can have randomization of things and find the happy accident that gives you the perfect shot. Being able to see the actors point at things and see what they're looking at was pretty transformative. It gave everybody context with the added benefit that if you want to move a mountain from there to there, you can do it instantly. You could switch between the Iceland location to the desert location, all within the same day of shooting. The ability to shoot a 10 hour dawn is extraordinary. To shoot any sequence where you say, oh, this world's not quite right, let's just move it a little bit an extraordinary number of benefits and advantages for shooting in that environment. It's mind-blowing what that tool is. What you see is really what you get, and that's something that really means a lot to filmmakers, especially those who have worked with a more traditional approach in the past. Shots of character in a vehicle traveling through a complex environment is always very difficult to do believably on stage. LED screens are a wonderful solution to that problem because what you're doing is you're taking this technique of image-based lighting that we've been using in computer graphics for years and use it to light a subject. And then we would do shoots where we would texture map real lit surfaces onto our game engine geo and so the camera could move anywhere. We would do interiors like Werner Herzog's office. And then you started doing things like building sets into it, having half a spaceship with reflective surfaces. And so it became exciting because by the end of the season, it was like, let's start designing sets around what this could do well. Just like the good old days. With Star Wars, we're building on a rich legacy of innovation and getting to partner with Jon Favreau to make his ambitious vision a reality, it's really a game changer for filmmaking.
Battle is Orpheus you hear, searching for your Eurydice who sleeps in the willow grove. I should have known you'd find me. We can't ever escape the fates. I know you guard Eurydice in this grove. Let me show you that our love is true. Orpheus has the power of music. Eurydice, the force of nature. Together, they could move mountains, roil the sea, change the course of destiny. A power that belongs only to the fates. And so they must remain apart. Thank you. 